Um, hi, this is Emily Freitag with Instruction Partners, and I'm so glad today to be talking to Scott Marion at Center for Assessment um, and really digging into a topic that I know so many educators are thinking a great deal about right now, which is um, assessment strategy, um, particularly in light of disrupted schooling. Um, Scott, thank you so much for joining us. And um, let me frame just a couple of questions and sure. you please just launch in. Um, yep. We do want to hear about your um, personal story as a learner and then yep. um, really want you to just frame what are you hearing and thinking about? Um, what are you hearing from schools and thinking about that seems good and worrying about when it comes to assessment? Oof. Um. You know, some of this, some of our assessment worries are actually many of our assessment worries are not new. We uh, we talk about at, at my organization, the Center for Assessment, uh, that assessment literacy, uh, you know, are the windmills we keep tilting at, you know, every every time we're out there. It's a never ending battle and we haven't made enough progress. So if we had, you know, really been in a great position with assessment literacy as a field before this, um, we'd be able to manage what we have to face next year a lot better. And what I mean by that is really high quality formative assessment processes that are literally inseparable from instruction, that you wouldn't know it uh, from a good instructional moment or a scaffolding opportunity or just high quality feedback, right? Most teachers are not very skilled at that. It's not their fault. They don't have, they don't have the practice, they don't have the training. Uh, Additionally, things like high quality performance assessment used to measure what kids have learned typically at the end of a unit of instruction or something like that. And so what we see is an over-reliance on commercial products that are used uh, because we don't trust teachers' judgments about what kids know and are able to do. So districts employ things we labeled interim assessments, and those are often administered two to three times a year with some purported instructional use. I don't understand how it could be instructionally useful if it only happens two or three times a year, right? Because you, you just can't group the kids in the fall and then leave them in those groups until the winter because it's not fair, to, it's called tracking. So, um, so, so we're facing a challenge, you know, in some ways it's like uh, New Orleans, right? You know, they're, they're below sea level and they've, you know, this, the oil industry has destroyed the marshes, right? So when a hurricane comes, they're so much more susceptible to flooding, right? So if they had this, if the seagrasses had been intact, if the city was built, you know, a little differently, so it was above, they'd be able to withstand hurricanes a lot better, right? And so COVID is like our hurricane, it's like our Katrina in a way, right? And, and so it makes it that much harder for us to withstand this because there is this pressure coming from lots of folks. It's coming from, I think everybody's well-meaning too, um, but it's that we need these diagnostic assessments uh, in the fall. But they're talking about them like their state should give them or districts should give them. And for me, when I think about diagnosis, it should be accompanied by a prescription. Otherwise, it's just, you got two weeks to live. Good luck, you know, <laughs> so, right? That's, that's a, that'd be a bad diagnosis, right? But in that case, you know, there, there is no treatment. But in most cases, you say, you know what? You have high blood pressure. You could try this in terms of diet or this in terms of exercise or this in terms of, of medicine to lower your blood pressure, right? It's specific to you depending on, you know, your age, your weight, your uh, and, and how high your blood pressure is. But if I just say, we're giving everybody blood pressure medication, that doesn't make any sense. And so our prescriptions need to fit our diagnoses. And in almost all cases, our diagnoses should be specific to individuals or at least small groups of individuals, you know, small groups of kids. And so that's yeah. what we, that's what we see as the, and it's a de-skilling of teachers as well, you know, say, you don't know enough to figure out what kids are ready to learn. So we're going to make you give this test. So I've been thinking about like in a medical context, which of course has a heightened 
uh, kind of relevance right now. Yeah, yeah. This notion of a diagnosis is also like you're diagnosing an illness, right? Like you are, um, you're not diagnosing the person, you're diagnosing right. for something, um, which I don't think is how the term is getting used in education. I think in education, it's, it's sort of this, like, I'm going to diagnose you holistically. And somehow that's going to like, tell me everything about how I'm going to teach. Um, is there an appropriate use for diagnostics in education? Like in a, in a, in a context of diagnosing for dyslexia, for example. Exactly, exactly. And, and what do those assessments actually look like? What does it entail to diagnose fully? And why are sort of interims not diagnostic? Yeah, so that's a great question. So you see that, you know, in most cases in our field, it's diagnosing for certain uh, specific learning disabilities in case of special education. Um, you see it with early literacy a lot you have these close uh, up assessments to see um, why a kid is either struggling to read or, or how well they're reading. Um, and it's almost always one-on-one, -on -one, right? And if it's not one-on-one, -on -one, it might be a more screening assessment that then leads to a one-on-one -on -one assessment. And so that's where you get into, that's what really, I, in my mind, characterizes it. Now, some people will say, well, you're just being a geek and it's it's really about you could diagnose a system that these kids are low i think the way it's being used now is the the illness if you will is learning loss right so we want to somehow gauge how much kids have lost but we're not measuring that in any kind of specific way it's just so you know the I've, i don't know if you've seen the nwea paper that says you know Kids mm -hmm. will come into the next, it, it doesn't even make sense on the face of it, but it's kids will come into the year having learned 37 to 50% of what they would have learned in a normal year. To, it's like, wait, we just had, they were in the school year for three quarters of the school year. So you're saying they learned two thirds of their, if it's 37%, two thirds of what they're supposed to learn in the last nine or 10 weeks of school? I don't think so. I think, you know, they're doing funny stuff with some, some of learning loss. But the, the point is um, that somehow I know that you learned less. I don't know what less. I just know, you know, you learn less. And now I'm just going to make sure you learn more. But it's, what do you do? Do you just teach harder, teach faster? Um, it, it doesn't tell you anything content specific. And that's the key thing, which is what we're pushing with our uh, friends at Student Achievement Partners and CCSSO and others, is that I need to know, like for Emily, what she needs to know to start this first major instructional unit of the year. I probably don't have to go back and reteach all of fourth grade to make sure she's ready to move forward into fifth grade. I need to know how well she's able to deal with fractions, um, adding and subtracting fractions, and perhaps fifth grade, maybe uh, multiplying some fractions, maybe not. Um, right, I need to know that as I move into the first unit, she'll I'll find out, oh, I need to, I need to figure out a way to supplement some of Emily's learning from what she would have learned last year, or typically uh, what she might have just lost in the summer anyway, to do that. And the reason why I focus on the first unit or the first and second unit, because if I go and give you an assessment of, let's say, all of fourth grade at the beginning of fifth grade, it's going to be a lot you forgot, right? But as you know, once you get in the rhythm of learning in fifth grade, I'm finding out stuff that you needed to know. I'm, so by the time we get through the first couple of units, the stuff that I might have thought that you were missing by the time we get to the third unit, you already picked up in the first two units. And so that's why these larger scale things to me are just, it's just, uh, it doesn't make sense. It's mm -hmm. like a carpet yeah. bombing thing, right? Um, Particularly if the resulting action actually then like damages identity or learning opportunities. Um, well, that's the worst, right? Is that yeah. basically you go, re, you know, you uh, instead of being in fifth grade, you're in fourth and a half grade. Mm -hmm. We're going right. to do a special track. It'd be a disaster. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, I have so many questions. Uh, take, I do think predictive assessments are something leaders crave. Um, and I, I understand why they do. They crave them so that they can know which teachers need more support. Um, is there any role you think predictive assessment should play? I, I also think like the full length practice test has been shown to improve results. Mm -hmm. Like let's not go into the test prep, right. you know, conversation yet. But like, is there a role that you think uh, kind of, you know, two months before the state test, let's do a full length practice test? Or do you think even no. that is damaging? Yeah, it's not damaging. It's just a waste of time. Mm -hmm. um, because <laughs> I don't, first of all, everybody talks about these predictive tests. Mm -hmm. All these tests correlate within subject and within kid pretty highly. Right, like third grade science correlates with, you know, eighth grade reading. Or no, not even that. I would say that, uh -huh. well, that, that's true because that's the general intelligence factor. But I'm saying mm -hmm. if I give any flavor of interim assessment or mm -hmm. even a decent classroom assessment mm -hmm. in fourth grade, I could have a decent shot of predicting the end of year fourth grade mm -hmm. test. Okay. Right. It's all based on correlation. So it's like your your instructional assessments can also just be predicted. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, it's like they say, you know, uh, high school GPA is, is just as good a predictor of first year mm -hmm. GPA in college as ACT or SAT, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, now, so anyway, so the predictive stuff, what I would say, what I have said to state chiefs and others is I ask them when they say, well, I want to do an assessment in the fall large scales to see where kids are at and see how much they lost. They said, okay. They said, do you have resources to direct differentially? If you find mm -hmm. that, wow, the kids here are much lower than the right. kids over here. Right. If, if you don't, then it's just an academic exercise. Right. Interesting is not actionable. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Talk to us though. Okay. So now let's go into the test prep notion though like i i do think there's um a strong sense of i want kids to practice with the format i want mm -hmm. kids to like understand how it feels is there validity in those instincts like are there other ways to achieve that that you think are more beneficial when teachers do want their kids to do well yeah if you want your kids to do well on the state test and they're not especially for the younger kids who mm -hmm. haven't seen the format and if it requires things for instance a lot of the newer tests require kids to manipulate certain things like with graded response answers mm -hmm. and things like that other kinds of technology enhanced items mm -hmm. if they have if that's not part of your regular instructional program mm -hmm. sure practice mm -hmm. but way less practice than people think Mm -hmm. Right. It mm -hmm. requires way less practice than people think. Yeah. Um, my uh, advisor in grad school, still a good friend, Lori Shepard, talks about this uh, thousand mini lessons problem. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So if I give this test to, you know, 50 kids, we'll say multiple sections, and it's a mm -hmm. 50 item test, you imagine this matrix of 50 by 50, right? So I got 2,500, mm -hmm. right? And now I'm going to remediate every kid on every item they miss. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. not a good instructional program. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there is something to be said with just learning the format of the test. That's not a validity thing. That, in some ways it is because it removes what we call construct irrelevant variance, right? You, you're not doing well on a test because you don't know how to deal with the gridded response, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Or you don't know certain other things. Um, but it's a it's a quick, it's a low-hanging fruit. It's, get and, and it. I, I feel like we spend like 80% of our energy on that as opposed to 80% of our energy on like content mastery. Yeah, right. And that's not like knowing grid response, but not knowing the answers is not going to be helpful. That's right. Yeah. You'll know the answer to that question that you practiced. Mm -hmm. But if, if only if it's then used to generalize to the larger concept. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so give us some vision of what you do think an appropriate assessment response to um, the interrupted schooling could look like. Yeah, so I think um, parsimony is going to be the key. It's going to be demanded. And, um, 
And so I'm okay with a relatively light touch uh, in a room or, and I actually prefer the ones that are tied to the state assessment system. So a lot of states and Smarter Balance has their, have their own interims that are connected to the state assessment scale. I think it gives you a different kind of look. It gives you, a, you could actually connect that to some levels of proficiency or things like that. Um, so I think that, um, but very light touch. I'm talking like one class period for ELA and one class period for math. And that will give you just some overall picture of how big the gaps are um, in general, how really maybe how much less kids can learn. But that should be um, that should be it, right? And then um, I, I think that where people should be spending the resources, and this is a challenge because it's a resource challenge, is that if you don't have a high quality curriculum, well, sorry, if you do have a high quality curriculum, it likely likely comes with some sort of assessment supports, right? And um, and so then you employ those mm -hmm. in this sort of you early. use your unit assessments exactly right. mm -hmm. if you don't have a high quality curriculum in some ways you have a bigger problem that assessment could solve mm -hmm. because that's mm -hmm. what i keep saying like it sounds funny the guy who heads the center for assessment is saying it's not an assessment problem but it's mm -hmm. not it's mm -hmm. a curriculum and, and instructional and school organization problem that mm -hmm. needs to be solved mm -hmm. and, right and so then i've um I'm pushing this notion of hypothesis testing, if you will, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because we can't wait um, till September 1st to say, oh, crap, Emily doesn't know anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have to now think about, based on the information I have from this spring, whatever, mm -hmm. however limited it is, how many kids were engaged, how many kids completely fell off the radar. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you're collecting anything that looks like attendance, um, mm -hmm. how well they attended. Um, and then uh, you could use that information to start making predictions of, oh, I think our kids will be this far below. I think. Mm -hmm. our, and then so if I just say, let's first say, let's say NWA is right. Let's say my kids are going to come in um, learning a third less, a third further behind than they would be. Mm -hmm. And our gaps, our achievement gaps have increased by two tenths of a standard deviation, mm -hmm. big, mm -hmm. right? Um, then what, what am I gonna do? How am I gonna organize my school differently? Am I mm -hmm. gonna bring in more paraprofessionals? Am I gonna create uh, uh, remediation blocks for certain mm -hmm. kids? Am I gonna mm -hmm. add, make seven math classes a week mm -hmm. instead of five? Right. right. So it's like scenario planning your classroom, actually. And Not, school, yeah. And some of it has to be because it's outside of the hands of teachers, right? Mm -hmm. so, I then, mean, I've heard a lot about scenario planning from the context of like the virus and the impact on schools. Yeah. So what I'm hearing you describe, which I think is fascinating, though different, is scenario planning for student readiness scenarios. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cause, right. Because you, you, you pretty much know already which kids are going to be in trouble mm -hmm. and but you should but then you use the assessment to say that fits you should actually have some a priori ideas of how the assessment mm -hmm. results are going to come mm -hmm. out um and so i think that um uh that would that would be help with efficiency sake mm -hmm. you know what mm -hmm. i mean um instead of just saying all right we got these assessment results now what Mm -hmm. it's too late you know yeah. the school year started you have to this planning has to be going on um immediately and mm -hmm. right like right like we're already late you know so i keep yeah telling, we're yeah. working on all these resources for ccso not just as part of this project yeah. with joanne mm -hmm. rebecca and you know we sort of have these deadlines of mid-july through ccso and i'm being the biggest pain in the rear end boss because <laughs> i'm on my local school board so i see right the emergency. right Faster, 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 yeah. we need to go faster at this. Um, and so, yeah, so if I had my way, I would be doing that hypothesis, I would do that very light touch, um, large scale. And if the state's going to do it, the district shouldn't do one too, right? Because mm -hmm. you know, then it's just too much. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and if the state makes theirs optional, the district mm -hmm. should think carefully about what information they care about and whether they use, because there's two 
two things you could look at, right? If I've been using NWA for 10 years mm -hmm. and I give it in the fall, I could say relative to where my kids were the past 10 years in the fall, mm -hmm. I could see how much further back they are, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or how much, you know, how much lower they're performing. So I could see that um, if I'm using that kind of assessment. If I'm using a state one that's linked to the summative assessment, I could say, here's how my kids are performing relative to state proficiency. So those mm -hmm. are two different questions. Those are value decision, mm -hmm. right? And, and, you th and a utility, so you have to think about what you're gonna use, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, so that, but they shouldn't do both. That is very clear, very parsimonious yeah. for yeah. these large scale things. Um, could, could, could you imagine if school started, kids have been out of school, let's say they didn't get to go back to school, kids have been out of school and they say, all right, we're doing assessment for the first week. Mm -hmm. Parents would flip out, right? Yeah. And well, they should. Yeah. I mean, my my four-year-old talks about the test all the time. Right now, he is not talking about school tests. He is talking about the virus test. And he is just uh -huh. kind of obsessed with the test and the idea of the test. And he, we did have to get tested to see my parents. And it is a brutal test. So I just, I mean, even the, even the trauma that I think hey, kids, we're going to take a test today might cause right. is like so real. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, and then, then I would focus as much energy as I can at supporting teachers at, at you know, whether it's through the SAP stuff that's coming out on priority mm -hmm. content, but about like, what's going to be your first unit of the year? How, and right. it's, it's not just the assessment piece, right? What right. are you going to do if you have to deliver it in a hybrid situation? Yeah. So it's all this stuff. It's all this has, stuff. Yeah. That has and to be. Planned. As a general kind of rule of thumb, um, would you start with the, like, if you do have a high quality curriculum, would you just start with the first unit as planned for that grade? What is your sense of like remediation units? I wouldn't do remediation. I would start now if the first unit you had planned is not on the high priority list of content mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, from, and it's not just SAP, TNTP yeah. is doing the same thing, yeah. right? Um, and hopefully those are aligned. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. but that's, I would start with whatever is the unit first that touches the, the most, high, the, high a high pro the first high priority, but you would go forward. You wouldn't try to like hypothesize what they missed last year that you'd have to cover. I don't think you could do it. Yeah, I don't think you do it well, um, yeah. especially the variability. Uh, you know, that's the thing that I think is really we have different kinds. So we 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 could predict certain socioeconomic and you know racial uh, uh, gaps that we mm -hmm. typically have had, but we're going to have gaps with, uh, as you probably know, uh, dual parent working families yeah. and and cases yeah. where just one parent's working and mm -hmm. could attend especially with the you know elementary age kids yeah that, you know that they can't attend to their kids as much as you know other parents and so yeah you're gonna have even those differences mm -hmm. um, and then you know they, there are the kids who checked out for a whole variety of reasons um, mm -hmm. especially the older kids so you know folks are saying that and i, I believe this like, like k2 literacy mm -hmm. be suffering really in, in a bad way right because yeah you need to be able to sit and read with kids or put kids in yeah reading groups, right both um, foundations and comprehension yeah. exactly but then also high school kids yeah. um mm -hmm. could be suffering because they're checked out yeah so. stay in k2 for one more minute um intervention like policy frameworks for rti mtss they often have an assessment component to them right any insight you can offer on how those kind of universal screeners or progress monitoring tools should factor in? Yeah, I mean, I think they have a certain purpose now um, mm -hmm. to like screen someone for MTSS. And so mm -hmm. you should continue to use those. You, um, and I was just reading something before we got on a call that some, somebody's worried, I think rightfully so, that we might get a whole bunch more kids screened for special ed. And mm -hmm. identify right and mm -hmm. that would clearly be a mistake because they mm -hmm. didn't all of a sudden 
become cognitively disabled mm -hmm. in some ways or develop a learning disability they're just mm -hmm. further behind so you don't want to see more kids especially brown and black kids identified for special mm -hmm. special ed mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. they should be used as they would normally be used mm -hmm. but not in any kind they're not going to magically be able to do something that they haven't been able to do before mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And certainly the layering of that on top of interims, on top of classroom, exactly. on top of state is the big thing yeah. to be aware of. Yeah, the, you know, if all teachers had high quality formative, uh, high quality formative assessment repertoire, mm -hmm. I would say we, we wouldn't need anything else. Mm -hmm. so, but they don't and they're going to need support. And, mm -hmm. and that's the other thing is where it's a tricky, it's on the school organization. It can't be up to every teacher to figure this out for themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Districts need to be pulling teachers in in the summer to sort of be the leaders of mm -hmm. their, their grade level, or their school or whatever it is, to be able to support other teachers in the school. Um, and whether that's developing, if they don't have the assessments with the curriculum, even if they do have assessments with the curriculum, they don't need to give every one. So which mm -hmm. one, who's gonna decide which ones to right. give? Right. Yeah, which are the most important right. anchor assessments. Right. Um, I, I just want to make sure to clarify one point because yeah. I think this is so important. So um, knowing that teachers don't have robust formative assessment repertoire um, doesn't then mean therefore standardized district assessment. So um, they're, they're teachers can get support for assessment that doesn't look like a purchased benchmark. Um, they can get support. I think I missed that. What um, does it look like to, to acknowledge that teachers need assessment support right. and yet not deliver that in the form of a product? Right, right. So that's, that is tricky because that, that's sort of the easy answer. Right. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, I've had a superintendent say to me, I can't afford all that professional development for this program we were running, right. but I can buy iReady for a lot less money. Right. And I said, did you just hear the words you said? Yeah. He said, yeah, yeah, I know what I'm saying. I know this, but yeah. it's, uh, and so that's, um, that is the struggle because people will think, well, I, I can't provide this professional, so I'm going to give them this test. But mm -hmm. it's just, it's you know it's like the drunk looking for his keys under the light post nowhere mm -hmm. else right yeah it's not, yeah right it's not going to tell you anything and yeah. so so you might as well not you might as well put everything you can into supporting teachers supporting teachers mm -hmm. and also and it would be important to do both sides so if your results look like this you should be thinking about grouping your kids. And mm -hmm. so in this time of, you know, budget cuts, we're asking a lot, but mm -hmm. this is the commitment it's going to take because schools are going to need this, these kind of mm -hmm. uh, supports. And I understand, uh, and I work in Chicago, I work in other mm -hmm. places that, you know, this is mm -hmm. good. Uh, it's a tough ask. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not just, you know, Newton, Massachusetts, we could pull this off, right? It's uh so we, we have to be able to do this in, in and it's harder, uh, you know, mm -hmm. it's harder in these big urbans, um, but it's, I, I don't see any other way, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. like to Chicago's credit that, you know, too bad it hadn't been fully open, but they did um, on this massive curriculum yeah. reform project, right? And right. You know, I, I wish they had been into it for another for two years previous. Yeah. They, they would have been much better In able to understand. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So my takeaways, and I appreciate this conversation. My takeaways, um, be very wary of diagnostic. Um, be generally parsimonious about assessment. Um, be skeptical if the impulse to buy an an interim is um, just I want to help my teachers because it may it may feel like an easy solution but it actually may may either be a waste if not be damaging yeah. um, 
it, it all has to link to instruction to your curriculum. It's really a curriculum centered assessment strategy. Exactly. Um, and um, it's really hard. Yeah. That's what I got. Really okay. That's, uh, you got a, you got a four on the listening comprehension rubric. <laughs> That's good. Well, thank you for the discussion. I know this is something very heavy on people's minds right yeah. now and I greatly appreciate our conversation. Yeah, no, and uh, I look forward to collaborating in the future. Uh, your organization sounds really interesting, so. Thanks, Scott. All right, bye-bye.